Take your Bibles, please. Turn to Acts chapter 17. And I did not know this would be the third message, but this will be the last. No, I, I, I pray, Lord, help me finish this message tonight. But this is, I just love this passage. Uh, this is my favorite part of the book of Acts. When we get into Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, this is the heartbeat of urban ministry for me. And I love this passage. So the message is declaring Jesus, declaring Jesus unto you. Paul goes to this pagan city, this university city, this city of enlightened men in darkness. It was an enlightened city, but they were dark because they didn't, they hadn't heard about Jesus. So here is Paul and his heart is stirred in him when he saw the city given to idolatry, verse 16. And he goes into the synagogues and he's preaching. Then he goes down into the marketplace and he's preaching Christ. And when they hear about Jesus, they said, uh, of Paul, what is this guy? He's just a babbler, like a seed picker. He's a plagiarist, a parasite. He's picked a little bit of this religion, a little bit of that, and he's put it together. He's made his own religion. You know, that's what they thought about Paul, a babbler. What will this babbler say? They say of the Apostle Paul, because he preached Jesus. He preached the resurrection. Verse 18, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods to them. Jesus was completely strange to them. Can you imagine? They didn't know about Jesus. They didn't know about the resurrection. And that's why Paul was there, to lift the veil of their ignorance because think about it and it says in, even in this passage they love to hear new things and they were always hearing and telling some new thing but they hadn't heard about Jesus yet and when they heard about him they said what's this strange thing what are you a babbler you know it's like they like to hear everything new except when it comes to the truth <laughs> then they start mocking but they bring Paul to the Areopagus, which was the area of the ruling body of Athens, the judges of Athens. And here's a, here's a picture of something of what Mars Hill may have looked like during the days of Paul, right under the shadow of the Acropolis of the Parthenon, there in the heart of Athens. And Paul meeting these Epicureans, and we talked a little bit about them, and we said these Epicureans were heathenistic, hedonistic, and atheistic. That is, they were pleasure seekers and believed in no God. And the Stoics, which were pantheistic, they believed God was in everything, but you couldn't know him personally, and you just had to accept everything as it was. They were fatalists. There's that song, K said, ah, said, ah. You know that? Whatever will be, will be. And you can't control it, and God can't control it. I mean, it's just circumstances are just going to happen. And no one's in control, basically. They were just fatalists. Things just run, and you can't control it. But as Paul stands to preach, and we talked a bit ab about this, is he said, as I was walking through your city, I beheld all your different idols, and there was an altar in verse 23 to who? An altar to who? The, the unknown God. And we talked about how there had been this plague, and basically the unknown God was given the credit for saving Athens from complete destruction about 500 years before Paul got there. But he was an unknown God, and now think of this, that was right at the time when the great philosophers that people still study to this day being Socrates was alive during that plague, and then after him was Plato, and after him was Aristotle, and guess what? The God who delivered them from the plague was still unknown. Those philosophers, with all of their light, all of their understanding of life and truth, because that's what philosophy means. Philosophy is the love of truth, the love of wisdom love of wisdom they didn't know him who is wisdom jesus and so these philosophers still 
left, left the people in darkness. And Paul is now there to preach Jesus and say, this unknown God that delivered you, his name is Jesus. That's basically what he, he, he has a name. <laughs> the one who delivered you from the plague and the one who will save you from your sin is the one who has risen from the dead. His name is Jesus. And so you could put, you, know, you could take all those idols away and now you can worship the living God, Jesus Christ. So that's why he says, whom therefore ye ignorantly, unknown, so similar root word, unknown is agnostic. Was, they were agnostic. They, they didn't know. And that, the root of, of that is ignorance, not knowing. And so him therefore that you ignorantly in your in that you do not know, I declare him unto you. And so that's what we said last week, that he's our creator, and he's the one God who made the world. That's verses 24 through 26. And we talked about these different laws of science. Say the laws of science with me, because I believe we should all know these laws of science. The basic laws of science, you could talk to any scientist in the world, and at least you can know this is pure, rock-solid science, and the evidence of science is on our side of creation. And true science contradicts the theory of evolution. True science contradicts the, theories, the theory of evolution. So the, the laws are what? Law of cause and effect. And that's rooted in Genesis 1-1. The law of biogenesis. That's rooted in Genesis chapter 1. That like begets like. One kind can only bring forth after its kind. The law of conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics, that's rooted in the scripture, that creation is finished. That's in the Bible, that's science, that nothing is being created or destroyed. And then the law of disintegration or entropy, things are breaking down, usable and energy is wearing out, and that's the law of sin and death, that's in the world. Okay, so there's sin and death. So. These laws of science are rooted in the scripture. I think that's amazing. So he's our creator. One God made the world. One God made one race. We are one race. There are not different races. You know, Christians have not understood this properly. I was talking actually to someone today and my alma mater used to have an interracial dating policy when I first went there. And Praise the Lord, it was lifted. I won't go into all that, but thank the Lord they did away with it. But I never agreed with it, and I've never practiced any kind of interracial dating policy because there's only one race. I was like, like, how can you have an interracial date if there's only one race? <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, so, so it goes against my faith that God made us all of one blood. Anyway, so I remember, though, uh, years ago, we brought, there was a young man who was saved in our church in Queens, Florio, he's from Haiti, and he, God called him to preach, so we were going down to Bob Jones, and then a friend from another church, from Faith Baptist Church in Corona, that we knew one of the ladies in the church, and she said, oh, can my son go down with you, you know, and see the school? We are like, yeah, that'd be great. And, and our friend, she was very sweet, she was, she and Debbie were fr friends, the mother of this young boy, young man, and, um, and she was, I think, part, she was like half Latino and half Asian. And then his father was black. So he literally had three of those cultures, the three cultures that PJ said were, were different races, white, Latino, and uh, uh, Hispanic, Caucasian, Latino, and, and Asian. I'm sorry, so Asian, Caucasian. So th those are the three people, uh, so-called groups that had to date only their own, you know? And so when we went down there, he said, well, you know, my dad is black and my mom is half Latino and Asian, who can I date? And they said, well, you have to pick one. <laughs> so anyway, that's how confusing that whole matter is. And, and you know, I, I'm just saying that even people in our, in our side have not always gotten this right. And I'm thankful that it's got more clarity with people like Henry Morris. Do we need to turn that air conditioner on, uh, please? No, are you guys all right? Or with people like uh, Ken Ham. You know, I, I really thank God for these men 
and and I believe that they've given us a lot of help in this area. Okay, the second thing I want to see is see with is this though that God is sovereign. God is sovereign, and we see this in verse twenty six. So let's get into this now. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined. He has determined. That is, he has put up the horizon. That word, we, we get our word horizon from that word determined. So the horizon is, is the, 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 the length of your vision. God has determined the times that have been before appointed. He has assigned the times, determined the times before appointed, and the bounds, that is the limits, the limits of their habitation, of where... He is the one who determined that you would be alive at this time. You want to dispute that? <laughs> You're alive. Now, why weren't you alive 100 years ago? Who determined that? God. Who determined that you would be born in what state? What state were you born in? Anybody? North Carolina. Who determined that? God did. He determined where you were going to be born, when you were going to be born, what family you were going to be born in. You and I, we had absolutely, what kind of choice do we have? None. This is saying God is sovereign. He's determined. He has predetermined our existence. He is in control over all circumstances, over all people, over all events. He rules, he overrules, he governs, he guides, he's in control, and he's compassionate, and he cares. God is sovereign. He has determined the times before appointed. What an amazing statement. Liter uh, recently, when we were studying in, I was studying the book of Esther for the Institute, and you know, the book of Esther, of course, one of the purposes of the book of Esther is it tells us what feast came out of the book of Esther. What Jewish feast came out of the book of Esther? The feast of Purim. So what does Purim mean? What do they get that word Purim from? Do you remember? From the lots. Why lots? Because when Haman decided when he was wanted to kill the Jews, what did he do? He threw the dice. Basically... In our culture, we would say he, he rolled the dice to see when, what day was he going to kill all the Jews. And you know what day it was? It was like as far away of the year as it could possibly imagine. So it was like 12 months away. So the Jewish people had at least all that time to pray and work through the situation so that they wouldn't all be killed. So when it came to, you know, and you know the story that Haman was killed on the gallows that he built for Mordecai, and then they celebrated and they feasted, and they, and they called that feast the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Lots. Because God, even in the greatest act of chance, pew, rolling the dice, the greatest act of chance, right? <laughs> luck, if you will, but it's not luck. In the greatest act of chance, there is no chance. <laughs> God's in control. God is in control, even in the casting of the lots. It's an amazing story. And with God, there are no coincidences. There are only God incidents. God is in control. He is sovereign. The second thing we see here is he is personal. And now notice what it says here. So God is so great and transcendent and sovereign and beyond our ability to fully know god is infinite in relation to time and we cannot fully comprehend that the infinite of god in relationship to time that he is eternal from eternity past before there was any material world there was god for how long before genesis 1 1 did god exist yeah, for all eternity, you, you, you think about that one for a while. <laughs> okay, You can't even imagine. I mean, it's beyond our ability to actually grasp. He's tra that's tra the transcendence of God. But here we see that he's imminent. And that's a, th these are theological words, but it's good to know a little theo theology, right? So transcendence means that 
he's in relation to time, in relation to space, he's infinite. Uh, beyond our ability to fully know, but his imminence means he's knowable, that he's a personal God. And that's what, that's what Paul is now preaching. He says that they should seek the Lord, the one who has determined all these times, the one who is imminent, the one who is sovereign, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him. And then what does it say after that? Feel after him and find him. You can find him. You can find God. He can be your friend. He can be your savior. You can be with him forever. If you find him, that you might find him. And guess what? I have even better news. This God who fills every point of space throughout this vast creation. Now, how, how big is, how, how much space is there out there? You think, just think about how, how vast is the universe? I mean, you, you've heard probably different preachers talk about, you know, how big stars are and how many, gal you know, how many billions. There's like billions of galaxies and we, billions of stars in every galaxy. I mean, it's just, it's just mind boggling, isn't it? How vast space is. Oh, I have news for you. The heaven of heavens cannot contain God. He is infinite beyond all of space. And, and yet, you can find him. Amen. And he's not far. He's not far. This God who fills all space, he's not far from you either. He is not far from you. If God feels far away, it's not because he is. It's because you're far from him. Repent and ask God to draw nigh to God. And what's, what will he do? He'll draw near to us. No, notice now what he says. He's not far from any, any one of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. And he even said, your own prophets, your own poets have said, for we are also his own offspring. So what is he saying here? He's saying that even unsaved people know that God is the one that gives life. And the life we have, God sustains the life we have. So whether you know it or not, God gave you life. Whether you know it or not, God is keeping you alive. Whether you know it or not, that breath you just took, he put it out on a platter for you to take and breathe in. He gave you that breath. Every breath we take, every drop of water, every crumb of bread, every stitch of clothing we have has been provided by God for us. And he knows about it from the foundation of the world. He gives life. He sustains life. He preserves us. He is before all things. And by him, all things consist. And that's what Paul says, in him we live. In him we live and move and have our being. We have life through him and sustained by him. And then he says, for as much as then, as we are the offspring of God, that means we have been born in the image of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. He's coming right after them now. <laughs> I mean, he is going right at, he is like making, he is charging at their idolatry that is permeating their whole culture, that is like right above him. So I took this picture from the Acropolis down on Mars Hill. Paul was standing down there somewhere on Mars Hill. And there was one of these big, huge, idolatrous worship centers, like right in his vision. And he says, God is not, you cannot make God into a stone. Now, there's a word here that's very interesting. So I, I'm, I know I'm going to shoot over some, some people's heads, and I don't mean to, but I just thought it was interesting. But I want us to look at this word Godhead for a moment. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone. Okay, so I've got this here on the screen. And it's, it focuses on this word Godhead. Okay, so I'm just going to read this. Can you all see that? Okay, so this word appears three times in the New Testament. And I'm going to ask Douglas, could you go to 2 Peter chapter 1? And you could read verses 3 and 4. And Wesley, could you get Romans chapter 1 verse 20? And a faith, could you get Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 for us? Okay, so you can read those verses when we get there. So this word Godhead in the English... 
appears three times in the New Testament in our English text. Now, there's slightly different words that are used each time, and I'm not enough of a Greek scholar. I've looked at a few Greek lexicons. I don't even think they know all the, the nuance of difference here. But they're slightly different, and I have, I have them here. But even Henry Morris, in his, and he has some excellent words in his, in his commentary about these verses, but the word refers to the essential nature of God, the essential and full nature of God. So when he says, you cannot look upon the Godhead as a piece of gold. You cannot properly represent the essence and nature of God with a piece of wood. You cannot do it. Paul's saying it's impossible to, and that's why God said that we are not to make any graven image and worship it. Because you cannot make God in his essence and worship him in his essence into gold, silver, or graven stone, something that man himself made. So the word refers to his essential nature, his full nature, and is associated with the triune nature of God. So you cannot depict the triune nature of God and worship the triune God in a stone or an idol of wood or, or, or a silver or gold. Okay, so here's these three words. The word in Acts 17 is theos, and all of these are Greek roots of the Greek word theos. So they all refer to the essential nature of God. And here, it's, there's a definite article before the Godhead. So the divine nature of God cannot be represented by any idol of gold, silver, or that's made with man. But what's very interesting about this word is is appears twice in Second Peter. So if you want to go there real quick, just do a word study on this, because the other two words only appear once in the New Testament. This word theos, this first one, appears in Second Peter chapter one, and it's translated divine in both Second Peter chapter one verses three and four, divine power and divine nature. So could you read those verses for us, please, Douglas? Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna break that down too much. Just to say that the word divine in those two words, you could do more study on that, is the same word Godhead. In other words, that the 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 power of the Godhead has given to us. You can almost read it that way. And the nature we have been partakers of the nature of the Godhead. We are partakers of the nature of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. We're partakers. Do you understand that? We partake of the very nature of the triune God when we believe in Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Divine power, divine nature. Okay. The second time we see the word Godhead is in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And so let's go to this passage. And Wesley, could you please read this one for us? Romans chapter 1, verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power, God, and God, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so by what man can see? what God has created, he can know something about God. What does he know about God? By the visible creation, he can know something of the invisible God. The visible creation, what does it do? The heavens declare the glory of God. That's why you cannot just boil down God to a piece of wood. You have to, the whole heavens and earth, all of his creation in its immensity and beauty does declare something to us of the infinite power 
wisdom, and Godhead. Something of his Godhead. In other words, and Henry Morris brings this out, and I, don't, I won't have time to break it down. You should look at his, his study notes in his Bible if you want. You can look at mine. It's very interesting. But I just put it here that God's glory is declared by his creation, right? Heavens declare the glory of God. So God's glory cannot be declared by a piece of wood, but his glory is declared by creation. Why? Because the physical structure of the universe is a tri-universe and reflects the triune nature of God. And Henry Morris brings this out better than anyone I've ever heard. And he basically says that we are living in a tri-universe, a continuum of time, space, and matter. And you try to get away from time. Try to get away from space. And try to get away from matter. And you cannot even fully separate them in the way in which we are living. It's a tri-universe. And Henry Morris believes that the tri-universe brings glory to the triune God. And I agree with him. Romans 1.20. And the third time this word Godhead is used in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. And can you please read that for us, Anna Faith? Godhead bodily. Bodily. Say it. Go ahead. Read it again. Go ahead. Very good. Thank you, sweetheart. You read so beautifully. And of course, you didn't have time to practice or anything. So, no. But I just wanted you to read it again because I like, you know why? I like that verse. That's why. Too. I wanted to hear it again. Who's the him? Jesus. So, you cannot properly represent the triune God in a piece of stone. It's impossible. But the triune God and the glory of the triune God, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, dwells in the person of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit of God, and Jesus. We see the glory of the triune God in the person of Jesus Christ. God's glory is revealed by his only begotten Son manifest in the flesh. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily. Amazing statement. So that's why Paul says, no, not, not something that man made. <laughs> not gold, silver. Okay? So God is personal. You can know this God. This immense God who's sovereign over things, he became a man. <laughs> And the glory of the triune God is manifest in the person of Jesus. And you can know him. You can seek him and find him. And know him as your friend. You can know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And fellowship with him. And then lastly, he says, God is judge. So this is a little sign that was is on Mars Hill that I took. And you could see the Acropolis right above it. This is when I went. These are pictures. These are not, you could tell they're not professional pictures <laughs> if I took them. <laughs> but that God is judge. Now, so we read this. Go to Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. He says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised them from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave to him believe, and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and the woman named Damaris, and others with him. So this is an incredible statement, and I always wondered what it meant. When Luke writes, the times of this ignorance God winked at. What times of what ignorance? The times of the ignorance from the plague in Athens, when they didn't know who delivered them from death and saved their city. The times of the ignorance of that plague then began the times of the great philosophers of Greece. There was the times of ignorance. Do you know what Paul's doing? He's saying that the times of the most famous philosophers of men 
without Jesus and his wisdom is what? It's just ignorance. And God was patient with them during that plague. They didn't know the name of God who delivered them. They were ignorant of his name. God could have destroyed them and wiped them off the face of the earth, but he winked at it. In other words, he showed mercy to them. And they were ignorant in the past of the, of the one who delivered them. But Paul's now standing before them and telling them, the, who is the name of the one who delivered them from that plague? They don't have to live in ignorance anymore. <laughs> His name is Jesus, the one who's risen from the dead. The, the philosophers never told the Athenians who that one was. They didn't know his name. These men left them in ignorance. By the way, we're studying church history. And the Protestant reformer Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, who basically laid the foundation for the Presbyterian church in the Swiss Re Reformation, he said that Socrates, Plato, Hercules, and others like them would be in heaven. Ulrich Zwingli said, Socrates and Plato, they didn't know Jesus and they were. Then notice what he says now. Remember the word back where God determined the times before appointed? He determined your life, right? He determined you to be alive during this time. Can you refute that or doubt that since you're alive at this time? Just as sure as you're alive right now, Paul's saying now in verse 31, God has appointed also a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom he has ordained. That word ordained is the word horizon. That same word horizon, which is, tra it's trans I, I don't want to lose you here, but it's the same word translated determined. God, who determined the times, has determined who's going to judge the world. That's it. Just as sure as you're alive, as we're alive standing here and sitting here, just as sure, God has determined that Jesus Christ is going to judge the world because he's raised him from the dead. He's appointed a day. So this name, Jesus, strange and unknown to you, is ordained to judge you as surely as he has determined the times in which you live right now. That's, that's the point there. And then lastly, I'll just say this. So in this, if you look at this little signage, it just gives the history of Mars Hill. And it says, the last paragraph, I don't think you can read it, but I'll read it. It says, the Areopagus is also associated with the spread of Christianity into Greece. Sometime near the middle of the first century, the Apostle Paul is said to have converted a number of Athenians by teaching the tenets of the new religion from the summit of the hill. Among the converts was Dionysius the Areopagite, the patron saint of the city of Athens, who according to tradition was the city's first bishop. Remains of a church named in his honor are preserved on the northern slope of the hill. And so Dionysius, it says, the Areopagite, meaning he was one of these judges of the Areopagus, one of the rulers on that Mars Hill. He became saved and became a pastor of the church in Athens. Let's pray.